everybody, our first screencast of Unit 4 is post-war America. And what we're going to talk about here is the things that people are coming home to uh, in the early 1920s. So our learning outcomes, you should be able to describe the problems of ratifying Versailles and the League of Nations, understand what happened in the Palmer Raids and how it was a violation of civil rights, and number three, discuss the pros and cons of the way America gets paid back in the post-war era. So, our first thing is the post-war issues. The League of Nations is going to completely divide America. And the problem with this is that it's just simply going to divide us Republicans and Democrats. Um, returning soldiers are going to face high unemployment rates unless they kick women out of their jobs. Um, a lot of women and a lot of minorities are going to lose their jobs to returning soldiers. Uh, women are going to be kind of sent back to take care of the home despite doing a really good job at their uh, at replacing men while they were overseas. The cost of living is going to double at this point. We had talked about previously wartime inflation, uh, people getting paid more but things costing more. Well, it's going to carry over into the early 1920s. Uh, things are now going to cost roughly double what they did before. And we're also going to see a lower production of goods here. Uh, we don't have the, the need to produce at such a high level like we did during the war. So that's going to start to uh, cause a little bit of issues. And we are starting to really have that fear of foreigners, that nativism idea. Uh, this is nothing new, though. I mean, go back to the 1850s and, and beyond that. Um, we are going to start to institute, after World War I here, the quota system uh, for immigration. Now, the meeting of the big three, I call them the big three. Your book will call them the big four. Don't, don't forget that. Uh, you have Woodrow Wilson. You have Clemenceau. And you have the British Prime Minister, and you have um, Orlando, the Prime Minister of Italy. Uh, Wilson is going to firmly believe in his 14 points. The problem is the other guys are not. Uh, they're simply going to reject it because they don't feel like Wilson uh, is that great of a diplomat. They don't believe that he has the knowledge or the skill uh, to deal with the type of issues uh, of invasion or war, considering that they, they just see him as a college president. The Allies want revenge on Germany, and that's, again, Britain and France specifically. Um, ultimately, this leads us to the flawed piece that we talked about before at the end of the last unit, and the ratification of the Treaty of Versailles and the 14 points where we don't even get involved in that. We have to make separate treaties afterwards. Now, the fight for ratification itself, you can see this uh, cartoon here with Henry Cabot Lodge walking the peace treaty out of the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations. Wilson is going to fail to include any Republicans uh, on the negotiating team uh, to create the, the treaty, uh, create his 14 points, uh, and the League of Nations. If he would have done this, the likelihood that it would have gone through is probably pretty high. Uh, Henry Cabot Lodge, again, he's the leader in the fight against the ratification. Uh, he doesn't want us to be forcibly involved in foreign entanglements. Uh, simply the cost of war is really high. Uh, think about what we loaned out to France and Britain and even Germany on the other side of things during World War I. He also believes that in joining a League of Nations that it's going to threaten our neutrality. Uh, Henry Cabot Lodge wants to leave declaring war in the hands of Congress and feels like if we join the League of Nations that it, could be, it will be taken out of the hands of Congress. Wilson is going to launch a speaking tour uh, to gain support, public support for the Treaty of Versailles. Ultimately, however, he's going to have a massive stroke and be relegated uh, to his bed for the final uh, months of his presidency and ultimately going to lead to uh, Republicans taking over the, the White House in 1920. Now, there's another picture of Henry Cabot Lodge just to get a better picture of him. Now, the Great Flu Epidemic, uh, this is going to break out in Spain. It's going to spread over Europe because of the unsanitary conditions of war. The trenches and the rats and all that sort of stuff is going to make it spread very quickly. Our soldiers are going to bring it back to the United States, and it's going to spread in three weeks from the eastern seaboard all the way out to the west. It's all it takes. Worldwide, this is going to kill between 50 and 100 million people. Uh, we have no cure for this. Uh, it's kind of like a bird flu or swine flu that we have today, the different strain of the, of the flu. We don't have anything to fix it. So what we're going to do as a government is to warn people. Uh, coughs and sneezes spread diseases. Uh, Spanish uh, Spread of Spanish influenza menaces our war production. Again, think about 
how long that you're supposed to wash your hands with antibacterial soap. You're supposed to wash it for 30 seconds. Uh, either the ABC song or the happy birthday song or whatever. Just do that next time that, that you are washing your hands. It really, 30 seconds is a long time when you think of soaping up your hands. Uh, I think the average is maybe 8 to 12 seconds tops. Here's an influenza hospital. This is in Kansas. Uh, this kind of reminds me of the film Contagion with all the cots laid out there of all these people that are sick. Now the Red Scare. Uh, there is a formation of the Communist Party in the United States prior to 1920. Uh, 70,000 strong. Bombs are going to get mailed to government and business leaders, which is going to cause a lot of panic amongst the civilian population. Uh, a. Mitchell Palmer, which you will see here, um, is going to institute what is going to come to be known as Palmer Raids. Uh, he's the attorney general. He is going to uh, kind of, in hopes of sniffing out a communist conspiracy or communist uh, potential revolution, he's going to start to invade homes and disregard people's civil rights in an attempt to oust a revolution idea. He never comes up with it, though. There's never any evidence pointing towards the communist revolution in, in all of the uh, raids that he conducted. Also, interesting uh, point, he is going to appoint a guy by the name of J. Edgar Hoover as his special assistant, who will later become head of the FBI. Now, Warren G. Harding. Warren G. Harding is part of the Ohio Republican machine, the Ohio gang, as it's better known, um, very corrupt uh, group of, of individuals. Uh, he's going to be elected on the promise of returning the United States to normalcy after the war. Uh, we have this kind of chaotic uh, ideal going on, uh, coming home from war and what the world is going to look like. He wants it to kind of return back to pre-war tendencies. He didn't believe that government should interfere in business or in the lives of its citizens. What he wants to do is a kind of similar to deregulation that we've had over the last 30 years of business, to where the businesses will be allowed to basically do what they want to do. Warren G. Harding is the most corrupted president that we've had, uh, with the exception of Richard Nixon. The Ohio gang is Warren G. Harding's uh, poker playing buddies, his drinking and smoking buddies. They're going to become very rich through grafts. And what remember what that was, uh, which was overcharging the citizens for government projects and getting kickbacks and so forth. The Teapot Dome scandal is what is going to really lay the landmark of Harding's presidency. There's oil-rich lands that are set apart for the Navy because this is at a time where the Navy is going to be transitioning from coal power to oil power, oil uh, like gasoline or diesel power. Um, his administration is going to lease this land to an oil company. And Albert B. Fall, the Secretary of the Interior, is going to uh, be the one to take the fall for this. So this is hence the term fall guy. Uh, this is where we get the term from. He's going to get a $400,000 kickback from this, and he is not going to give up anybody else that was involved in the scandal. So after the Teapot Dome scandal, Warren G. Harding is going to take a trip out west. Uh, he's going to try to reconnect with the people, try to avoid any additional scandals by the Ohio gang, and also kind of separate himself from that Ohio gang. Unfortunately, on his trip, he went up to Alaska, first president ever to do so. On his way home, coming through San Francisco, some people say that he was poisoned. Other people say he had a heart attack. We really don't know. He ends up dying. Uh, Calvin Coolidge, his vice president, will take the oath of office. Strangely enough, it's by kerosene lamp. Over 20 years into the 20th century, he's taking the oath of office by kerosene lamp. We've had electricity at this point for about 40 years. Coolidge is going to plan to re restore the integrity to government. Warren G. Harding and Calvin Coolidge are polar opposites, really. Uh, Coolidge is all about integrity and in business, uh, where Warren G. Harding is all about the kickback and the good old boys club kind of thing. So Coolidge again. Coolidge is the former governor of Massachusetts. He is going to gain a lot of notor notoriety for breaking the police strike. Um, he believes that there's no right to strike against public safety because as a police force, if you strike and there's no one there to protect you, it's going to cause mass chaos. Think back to the, uh, the recent movie, The Purge, where was it for 24 hours where anything is legal? There would be mass chaos, not just driving 80 miles an hour down Hawthorne, but crime would, would break out like crazy. This is all going to propel him to the vice presidency. He is quoted as saying the chief business of, of the American people is business, meaning America is capitalist. America is all about business and getting ahead. Now, payback for World War I. Britain and France, we start calling on them to pay back that $10 billion that they owe us. The problem with that is they don't have it. So we start to develop two ways of trying to get it back. 
selling goods to the United States is basically out of the question. We try to put forth this 4D McCumber tariff in 1922, which is a high import tariff. We apparently have not learned yet. Instituting a high import tariff is not going to get us any sort of money because these countries are not going to import as much. So what we're going to do is try to collect rep reparations from Germany. However, Germany is going to default on their payments to Britain and France. We are going to pass what is going to be known as the Dawes Plan, which is going to loan money, $2.5 billion, to Germany. Germany will then pay it to Britain and France, uh, who will then pay it back to us. It's kind of a funny way to do it, but it's not like it happens all in one week. So Germany, uh, Germany will use the money to rebuild its infrastructure, rebuild business, and will pay back Britain and France, which will do the same before it gets back to us. So let's recap. You should be able to describe the problems ratifying Versailles and the League of Nations. Consider uh, Henry Cabot Lodge and the fact that Woodrow Wilson completely drafts the League of Nations on his own and doesn't include any Republicans. Number two, understand what happens in the Palmer Raids and how it was a violation of civil rights, just basically busting into people's homes with no rhyme or reason. And number three, discuss the pros and cons of the way America gets paid back in the post-war era. How effective is it to loan money to Germany? And then they're going to give it to France and Britain and then going to give it to us. Some people say we're just paying ourselves back, so we're really not making any – we're not making that money back. We're just loaning out another $2.5 billion. So if you have any questions, find me in class, send me an email. Um, thanks for watching, and we will see you next time. I'm out.